Welcome to Paramook 2023. I'm Nancy Grody and I'm the moderator for this session. This is me. The course is called Paramook, meaning Parapsychology Massively Open Online Course. The official name is Parapsychology Research and Education. This year's topic is apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists. The course started on Fe the live sessions of the course started on February 28th and will complete on April 1st. You can register at any point during the live sessions, and there will be things to do over the year as well if if you keep a track of the Parapsychology Foundation and the Parapsych and Parapsychology Online or the Paramook. Uh, group all three of those on Facebook or subscribe to the the website parapsychologyonline.org you'll have that information first thing I would like to do is thank the organizational team Brian Williams of the Psychical Research Foundation of and Natasha Chisis of Chis Film both of them are in Albuquerque New Mexico I also would like to thank Lizette Coley and Anastasia Demalis, the President and P Executive Director of the Parapsychology Foundation. This foundation has uh, supported this course since 2015 when it first started, and their support is extremely important to us and our ability to carry this out. So thank you guys so much. Today we have Timothy Hart from Mesa in Springfield, Illinois. His talk is called A Journey, Journey Through the History of Apparitions, Hauntings, and Poltergeists, and an introduction to MESA, which stands for Multi-Energy Sensory Array. It's used in field investigations, and today is March 15th. So MESA is a computer system specifically designed to measure energies associated with haunt and poltergeist phenomena. Tim's group have measured over 250 sites since 1994. MESA measures infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, vibration, electromagnetic fields, the operation of random number generations, barometric pressure, humidity, and temperature. He will present and discuss preliminary findings of the use of this particular system after a review of the timeline of reported apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists. So with, without further ado, Tim, take the floor. I was just at the right place at the right time. Um, I had a really good mentor at the University of Illinois at Springfield. His name was Ronald Havens, and he was a hypnotherapist. I believe he's retired now. He just, uh, <laughs> he rides motorcycles all over the United States, actually all over the world. And um, so I'm still in contact with him a little bit on Facebook. Um, so I wrote my thesis about ghosts and poltergeists at the U of I at Springfield. And I was just lucky because I had just the right people, just the right time, and uh, got to do that. So my presentation is about the computer system that I co-designed with uh, another guy, another genius guy. His name is David Black, and he lives in Florida. And I believe he works for SpaceX, and he does a lot of... Uh, firewall stuff so that people can't hack into their computer systems but he's really the one that kind of put this system together and so uh multi-energy sensor array and i will try to explain that as we go here but uh first i want to talk a little bit about the history of ghost hunting so i'm going to try to uh here we go this brief Okay. Oldest poster, guys, was uh, in China that's been reported. Uh, there were uh, pots, silverware, and things of that sort being thrown around, actually thrown out the front door, and things like that. Uh, 
They reported uh, all kinds of ghosts, poltergeists, uh, different spiritual phenomena in ancient Sumerian, Egyptian, Mesopotamian texts. The, uh, the stories are, are ancient and, and widespread. Many different uh, cultures, things of that sort. One of the first things I ran across was the Thenodorus. You may be familiar with this story. Um, Athenodorus was a Stoic philosopher, and it was reported to uh, or by Pliny the Younger of, uh, quote, an emaciated, fettered man. It rattled chains, brought death and disease to the visitors. At first, Athenodorus ignored the phantom. Then one night he followed it into the garden and it vanished. The next day, he had officials dig it up uh, in the garden and found a skeleton in rusty chains. After a proper burial, which appeased the ghost, the haunting ceased. And I thought that was a real interesting story. And then, of course, they have uh, Homer's Odyssey, which talks about ghosts, the afterlife. Uh, Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey had to descend into the underworld and question Tiresias, a ghost and great prophet, about when he would be able to return home. Uh, then we have uh, different biblical ghosts. Um, of course, the one in 1 Samuel is 2815. Saul has a medium, the witch of Endor, summon the prophet Samuel. And then, of course, there are many other times, uh, some people are not sure, but Jesus appeared after his resurrection, Luke 24, 34 to Simon, Mark 16, 9 to Mary Magdalene, Luke 24, 36 to 11 of the disciples, Luke 24, 39 uh, which talks about a ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. Matthew 14, 26, it is a ghost or an apparition, one of the uh, disciples said. Uh, he appears to other saints, and other saints appear as well. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1, talks about spirits being all around us all the time. Mark 9, 4 uh, talks about Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. So you have many ideas about what ghosts are, um, things like that. James IV of Scotland in 1513, he was warned by a ghost that said he would die in a battle. Uh, he was warned by an apparition which was in a church, not to make his fatal expedition to England. Uh, it was a church in Linlithgow. He ignored the apparition's warning and was killed in battle. Shakespeare talks about three different ways that ghosts appear in his literature. Uh, one, the first is a vision or purely subjective ghost that a person might see. Secondly, there's an authentic ghost that has died without the opportunity for repentance. And then thirdly, there's a false ghost, which is capable of many types of manifestations. Then we go uh, kind of skip around here to the, the drummer of Tedworth. 1666, a Reverend Glanville investigated two girls that reported strange drumming uh, from behind a, a bolster, which is a bed headboard, and they could find no cause or trickery could be found for it. Many types of uh, things happened there. Object moved through or, or thrown at people. 
uh, there were terrible stenches, smells that invaded the house, disembodied voices and animal noises, lit candles that floated around, uh, chamber pots were turned over on beds, coins jingled and turned black, doors opened and slammed shut, eerie glimmering lights were seen at different times, younger children levitated on the bed, some were pinched, children and servants saw ghostly figures, after scattering ashes to capture the culprit, they found claw marks, circles, and unknown letters etched into them. Uh, Daniel Defoe talks about ghosts in some of his stories. Essay on the history and reality of apparitions. He was a writer, journalist. He wrote Robinson Crusoe. And a specific story is the apparition of Mrs. Veal, V-E-A-L. Franz Anton Mesmer, you might have heard of him. Well, he first used magnetic fields and later hypnosis to allegedly cure people. He attempted to manipulate fields in and outside the body to make people better, but he abandoned this practice and did not do it any longer. Byron talks about ghosts. See if I can find his. Oh, yeah. His little story is that he met with other people. Uh, Shelley, Claire, and Polidori. And they agreed to write ghost stories. And Byron becomes jealous because Polidori and Shelley <laughs> wrote better stories which became Dracula and Frankenstein eventually. Uh, Charles Dickens, okay, real famous there. Uh, he talks about A Christmas Carol where three ghosts appear. Uh, he also had other stories that talk about ghosts. Goblin and the Gravedigger, Ghost and the Wardrobe, Mail Coach Ghosts, the Signalman, and Story of the Bagman's Uncle, which was also known as the Pickwick Papers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Hawthorne talked about uh, ghosts in The Ghost of Dr. Harris, Graves and Goblins, and The Haunted Mind. Uh, who else we got? Tennyson. Yeah, he... Uh, wrote a couple of stories, The Princess and Guinevere. Um, used a little bit more subconscious or subliminal spiritual ways uh, that humans may live beyond physical death. And then we have the Fox Sisters. Everybody probably knows a little bit about the Fox Sisters. In 1848, they started a spiritualist movement in Hydesville, New York, where mysterious wrappings, and they named a ghost Mr. Splitfoot. Uh, later, they were found to be a hoax, uh, but they kind of started a movement. And then the Ghost Society of London is formed, 1851. Uh, it was at Cambridge University. Uh, and then the London Ghost Club in 1862 formed. Uh, and then we have William James. Okay. Uh, he was a brilliant philosopher, psychologist, and he started the American Psychological Association. He was also a founder of the American Society for Psychical Research. He studied a uh, specific medium, Lenora Piper, and found that during altered states of consciousness, she received information others 
were not aware of and was it was verified later. Um, so she may have been for real. Some people think still think so to this day. There's many other people on here. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to go through them all. Here word Carrington. Harry Houdini. He was famous magician. Medium debunker. Investigated many spiritualists, psychics, and mediums. He, he was at first a cynic, then later a believer in psychical phenomena as the result of experiences that he had. He was obsessed with contacting the spirit of his mother. Thomas Edison suggested it might be possible to make an electronic device that permitted spirit communication later said it was a joke. Nandor Fodor, another uh, researcher, uh, he was a prominent psychoanalyst, psychical researcher. He was Hungarian. He looked at uh, parapsychological views and experiences uh, that Freud and Jung had both experienced and at one time, Freud told Jung that he wished he had studied psychical phenomena. Then uh, you have J.D. Ryan in the 1930s. He studied ESP. Uh, he was kind of a pioneer of parapsychology. He founded the parapsychology lab at Duke University and the Journal of Parapsychology. Uh, and a foundation for research on the nature of man. He had did many Zener card tests uh, to look for, uh, to see if people could read cards that were hidden. Let's see. Yeah, Hans Bender. Let's see if I can find him again. In the 60s, he was a German lecturer on parapsychology, founded the Institute for Grenzgebiet der Psychology and Psychohygiene in Freiburg, Germany. He studied poltergeists and clairvoyance, uh, really wanted to look at how psychology, clinical psychology could help with parapsychology and psychical research. Uh, the Rosenheim poltergeist was his most significant investigation in 1967. D. Scott Rogo, another famous uh, writer. These are not in order. I should have had them in order. Okay. He was one of the first researchers that thought haunt and UFO phenomena went together. He was a professional musician and a kind of a parapsychological historian. Stanley Krippner, who I got to meet at the 2001 Parapsychology Association, humanist psychologist and parapsychologist. He was pretty important. The Ghost Research Society forms in 1977. Uh, I was a member of it for a little while. Uh, it's kind of up by Chicago, Oak Park, uh, which became the Ghost Research Society. Um, and then, uh, what's it called? Uh, anyway, Harvey Irwin, great researcher. Uh, looked at the frame of mind of the percipient during certain psychical phenomena and did some experiments. Uh, I don't have him on here, but I should. Charles Tart in 1965 actually called for instrumentation to study haunt phenomena in the field. 
You know, of course, we have Harold Pudoff, Russell Targ, uh, both physicists, and uh, they studied Yuri Geller, Ingo Swan, Pat Price, uh, Joseph McMoneagle, and they looked at remote viewing to see if it was for real. They worked on different types of uh, tunable lasers, electronic beams, and uh, a thing called Stargate. Had a zero point field. Uh, you'll have to excuse. I have a 16 year old Pomeranian and he has, I guess it's some kind of trachea problem. So I'm sorry if he, you can hear him coughing. And then, of course, during a lot of this time, there's William Roll, who uh, invited me to speak at the 2001 Parapsychology Association Convention, which was in New York City. Uh, he was an eminent parapsychologist, worked at the University of West Georgia. He investigated many haunts and poltergeists. Uh, he's published many papers books over a hundred uh, he thought that we should use physics to explain what is going on uh, he looked at a more holistic model of the universe consciousness itself in humans look for unusual experiences and it's a natural thing that occurs in human development and growth. So there are many cases he investigated, which include the Olive Hill, Miami poltergeist, uh, worked with William Joins, who was a physicist at Duke. They came up with several different theories, I think, uh, focusing, attenuation, and different things like that. Michael Persinger, he did all kinds of experiments using magnetic fields. He was from Canada. He was a cognitive neuroscientist. He researched magnetic fields and brain activity how they interacted, uh, found that people, when exposed to certain fields, would feel a sensed presence, felt like they weren't alone, or maybe that something else was in the room with them. He also thought that tectonic strain theory, that the Earth's crust produces different, uh, both physical activity glowing balls of light ufos and they can ex people experience things directly in their brain geophysical variables people experience waves of fear tactile sensations nightmares apparitions sensed presences uh, and that these fields might change between one and five micro Tesla uh, from different sources, which might include 60 Hertz magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, but also geomagnetic fields from the earth. He thought electromagnetic fields could also suppress the production of melatonin in their brain. Uh, transient complex temporal patterns of power frequency magnetic fields generated by less than optimal grounding in a dwelling may be sufficient to evoke experiences in brains, especially of sensitive individuals. Uh, he thought there, were, oh, he did different lab studies uh, where a sentient being was actually produced by uh, weak applications of uh, 10 milligauss in brains 
many people reported a sensed presence. He also did other experiments where people felt experiences of spiritual visitation using magnetic fields. Dean Radin, who I met at the Parapsychology Association Convention, he's written a few books on uh, the conscious universe, one called Entangled Minds. He's also done work in physics and psychology, consciousness, how mind and matter interact, remote viewing, and telepathy. He actually tried to uh, make or produce ghosts or spirits in a lab. And uh, another group of researchers, Braithwaite and Townsend, they looked at complex 60 hertz or 50 hertz fields. And they actually had a, a computer system to do that. They called MADS, uh, Magnetic Anomaly Detection System. So what is haunt phenomena? I mean, what is? nobody even talks about what it really is. Everybody wants to hear a story. Everybody's got a story or whatever. If they go into an old house or maybe it's their house they live in, whatever. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is. It's visual types of phenomena, shadows, shapes, forms, fog, mist. Maybe there's lights or orbs, flashing lights. Sometimes people see stuff that looks like real people. Haunt phenomena is place or sight oriented, S-I-T-E, sight oriented. Secondly is auditory phenomena, raps, pops, cracks, noises, explosions, uh, sounds of broken glass, uh, howls, conversations, babies crying, footsteps, breathing, screams, or sighs. People have heard all kinds of things. Olfactory phenomena, perfume. Cigar or cigarette smoke, sometimes pipe smoke, rotten flesh, potatoes, uh, and it's transient. It comes and it goes. It's very localized at times. Sensed presence, okay? This is a more subjective experience of being stared at, watched, not alone. Goosebumps. Or your hair stands on end on your neck or your arms. Tactile sensations, being touched, hit, slapped, fondled, tripped. Maybe you have nausea, dizziness. Maybe you don't feel like you can breathe, anxiety, different things. Sleep disturbances, waking up, not able to go to sleep insomnia and this may be the result of other phenomena that we're talking about on this page the sudden onset of emotional episodes right such as depression anger fear violence or maybe that sense presence you feel like you're not alone cold spots drafts breezes transient localized spots of cold air some people experience hot spots or maybe one of their uh, arms or legs suddenly feels real hot. Floating lights, orbs, luminosities. They can go through walls, doors, windows, even people. Strange responses by pets or animals. Uh, they will not go into a room. They sit in a certain chair, growl, or a cat may hiss at a certain corner of the room. 
or a room. Object movement, doors, windows, keys, money, clothing, uh, chandeliers uh, may swing, lamps fall of their own accord. Uh, lastly on here, I have erratic functioning of equipment, drained batteries, uh, video, audio, or other data recording devices, uh, malfunction. They fail to work in different places. There are other effects as well. Infrasound associated with distant tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, thunderstorms, different vestibular alterations, body motion effects, uh, visual effects, feeling of apprehension, uneasiness, nausea, dizziness, feeling pins and needles, uh, depression, fatigue, headaches. Paranormal experiences usually reported between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. And then there's a major peak between 2 and 4 a.m. local time. Electrostatic effects can be mediated through conductive materials. If you're on the telephone or through power lines, uh, any kind of metal, even the nails in a building can become ionized. Electrical storms can cause haunt effects. Values of 115 to 140 volts per meter in places. Strong fields, voltages may affect the DC system in a human. The spinal cord, uh, central nervous system through polarity reversal or intensification. They might experience things where a normal dream could become as real as it could possibly be. Okay. Previous ways people have studied haunts, experiential reports, investigator reports, all these different ways. Okay. Analysis of reports. They've used uh, statistics to analyze where people might place. Uh, if you give them a floor plan, and they write on that floor plan from a checklist or they make a checklist. Um, there's videotape recorders. People could use dowsing rods, audio tape recorders. EEG, brainwave patterns. Three cameras triggered with a photoelectric light curtain. Coil mechanical vibration sensors. Magnetometers. Electromagnetic field meters. Uh, voltage magnifiers. Geiger counters. Random number generators, which we started to use last year. Thermal vision, uh, forward-looking infrared vision cameras, and computers. Okay. All these things have been used to study haunt phenomena. Apparitions. A lot of this information I gathered through many years, but also talking to William Roll, uh, a few other people too. Do not, they do not always appear as full-bodied forms. In many instances, only a part of a figure appears. Uh, phantoms may show only that portion of a figure which can be recognized. Dreaming, twilight states, decreased vigilance, may increase the likelihood of both detection and response to phenomena. Investigations of apparitions face the same problems as other spontaneous psi phenomena, fraud, errors of perception, 
memory and time, all of these things, you know, mediate the experience itself. Nevertheless, some of these reports raise the possibility of extrasensory perception. Apparitions may show evidence for extrasensory perception in two ways. One, an apparition may correspond to an event in space-time that is beyond the reach of the sense organs or any logical inference, such as the unexpected death of a friend. Uh, app apparitions with an uh, extrasensory perception component are usually called veridical apparitions. Two, an apparition, whether or not it corresponds to an actual event, or individual may be collective or described by two or more observers. There are many other types of characteristics of apparitions. Usually, they tend to be of a deceased or a living person in the physical location that person had occupied, or near people who have been connected to the person in the past. And, and that might, might include family. Family is a big part of that. Close friends or relatives are more common than apparitions of people that you, you do not know. Apparitions of the dead decline in number with increased time from the time of death. Apparitions that reflect accident and death are more common than apparitions involving trivial events. Apparitions are more likely to be seen in the evening or at night than during the day. This could be due to reduced noise from sense perception, relaxation, the electrical and magnetic things are, are, are turned off. Sigh may occur more often. Uh, psychical images form. Apparitions may be limited to the cognitive capacities and emotional interests of the percipient. Apparitions rarely show evidence of purpose or motivation. When an apparition seems to reflect a need by the person seen, this is usually also the percipient's need. Sometimes apparitions may represent living or deceased individuals, sometimes imaginary entities, or even buildings. Apparitions are often reported at haunts, along with other phenomena, banging sounds, footsteps, odd smells, temperature changes, erratic functioning of equipment, which we already talked about, unexplained physical incidents, object movement, or doors slamming. Poltergeists. Poltergeists are a little bit different. They're usually around a person, person-oriented. Haunts are sight or place oriented. Poltergeists are usually short-lived compared to haunt activity. Poltergeists might last three months, then disappear, then reappear. Uh, poltergeists may be more malevolent, angry, um, mysterious fires, Fluctuations in temperature. Objects may disappear and then reappear. Uh, those are called apports. Stones are thrown. Water appears and then disappears. Tactile sensations are usually a little more extreme. You may be slapped, hit, kicked, tripped, or even held down. Static electrical charges and fields may occur. Strange smells of rotting flesh, potatoes. 
focusing and lingering effects. The area and even a specific object moves, most likely that object will move again. Uh, William Joins, who worked with William Roll, suggested there is a wave theory, a thought energy which is exhibited in a wave pattern, kind of like electromagnetic fields or sound. It can be described in similar graphic uh, or mathematical relationships. The energy can be reflected, transmitted, reinforced, and canceled. It may also have attenuation properties. Uh, there's a rotating beam theory, the direction of objects. Uh, most likely, it may go into a clockwise or a clock or a counterclockwise pattern. And in poltergeists and, and those types of uh, cases, there might be psychokinesis, okay? recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, which William Roll suggested, the power to move objects with his or her mind as though a certain subconscious level of the personality may be able to express itself by exercising a physical force of an unknown kind, which is dependent on an abnormal physiological condition. The most electrically unstable part of the brain is the hippocampus and different parts of the temporal limbic system. Okay. So, while I was at the University of Illinois Springfield, we created a system to look at variables in the environment, which we labeled contextual variables. These are things in the environment that people take in that may color or change what they experience in different ways they do that. I wish I could take questions from you guys, but I guess I'll just have to. Uh... I do have a I do have a question if you would like it. Sure. Um, this is from Eduardo. He says, Timothy, any thoughts about the God helmet device that Michael Persinger uh, yeah. had um, that makes people have some interesting experiences? Yes. Michael Persinger came up with a helmet where he could expose people to different magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, uh, and people definitely experienced things with the helmet. Sometimes they saw aliens on the ceiling and began to converse with them, actually talk to them. And some people had different experiences like uh, waves of fear. Um, maybe they would, they felt like they weren't alone in a place. Maybe they were being stared at or uh, somebody was standing or sitting in that room with them and things like that. Okay, so what you have as a contextual variable, belief in ghosts, right? People just believe that if you die, you can come back. Right? And that's a widespread, kind of universal. Um, there's a cultural expectation that uh, ghosts are real. 
People have experiences all the time. Demand characteristics. If I tell you a place is haunted, you're probably going to have an experience there. Okay. Place is haunted. Demand characteristics. Have you heard that this blah, blah is haunted? That this place might have a ghost? And of course, you have historical context. Uh, emotional or physical state of a percipient. Maybe they're in bereavement. Maybe they see somebody they know at the place. Embedded cues. A smell or color or an emphasized word uh, is given to that percipient. Metaphorical or symbolic references. If I wear black clothes and it's 12 midnight, it's on Halloween, I'm at a dead man's curve. I decide to use a Ouija board with other people. Uh, I, I get a black cat. I decide to have a seance. I get some black candles, all those things. Okay. You're probably going to have an experience there. Climactic conditions. It was a dark and stormy night. Maybe there was fog. Maybe the humidity changed enough that you could sense things. And then you have congruence. Usually, a ghost is clothed. It has clothing from the past. You can recognize that it's old. Uh, you see, you always see uh, cowboys in saloons, things like, of that sort. Uh, then you have, of course, your temperature, drafts of air. Uh, maybe a place is acoustically different. Maybe it has a little echo, or maybe it's real dead, and you can hear things really well. Even the room, the, the size, the room layout of a, of a place can also be a contextual variable. Okay. So at the same time, we're doing all this history, and we're looking at contextual variables, we're looking at how they studied things in the past. I, I came up with a computer system with Dave Black. And it's a computer that's connected to an analog to digital converter. And we decided to study things that are physical. Okay. So we decided to study infrared, visible, ultraviolet light. We look at 60 hertz. Uh, we have a tri-field sensor that measures 60 hertz electromagnetic fields. Uh, we can look at vibration. We measure background gamma ray radiation. Uh, we also measure the geomagnetic field three-dimensionally. Uh, right now, we have uh, kind of a west, up, and north, orthogonal. Uh, we measure temperature, barometric pressure, and humidity. We have a little weather station that we use. Uh, and we also use another system once in a while that uh, is made by a company called Vernier. And they have sensors that uh, high school and college people use to study physical things in an environment, uh, which include uh, geomagnetic fields, vibration, velocity, sound, things of that nature. So then we have kind of preliminary findings, okay? Um, this is your uh, random number generator, okay? And uh, I've seen four different graphs of this nature. Uh, still don't know what's going on there, but I think 
it's directly related to the magnetic fields. But I also kind of wonder about one other thing, which is gravity or microgravity and how that might change in a place over an hour. We usually measure a place for an hour, and then we might do another sample of the same area or maybe a different area in a site and see how there are differences in uh, different places. Here's your three-dimensional static field meter sensors. Okay. The geomagnetic field in a place. And this one is east and west, east to west. And then you have north and south. Okay. Those fields, I think, are one of the culprits in haunt phenomena. And I think we need to measure those the best way we can. So we actually use a amplifier that amplifies the signal enough that we can see those changes. Then we have the light. This is infrared light in that place. Uh, we go to the Weather Library. It's in Evansville, Indiana. I've measured that place 24 times now, usually for at least an hour. Uh, we have to go in at 1130 at night, and we can stay until the sun comes up. I usually don't stay that long because I can't stay awake, <laughs> but that's what we do. Here's a uh, tri-field meter. I think if you're in that place at that time, you might experience something with that that change, uh, maybe a sensed presence, feeling like you're not alone. Maybe you feel you know somebody like the, somebody's there with you. And then we have the geomagnetic fields. This is a pretty small change. It's not really a big, but it does go from around 0.4 down to negative 0.8. And it might be if you're walking through there or sitting in that room, you might experience a, a, a change or a difference. And it, it's going to be different with different people because the research also says that Women tend to hear things like footsteps, babies crying, breathing, uh, sighs, things like that. Men tend to see things, uh, shapes, forms, mist, shadows, things like that. This is West. You can see the changes there. And then the last one is barometric pressure. And I think people can definitely sense that differently, uh, you know, maybe in your sinuses, maybe in, you know, the way that you experience an environment but everybody's kind of different. And that is my presentation on Mesa. Thanks for listening. Any other um, questions? Yeah, we do have some other questions. Uh, uh, one, well, first, uh, there was a comment as you were talking about uh, how interesting your your build up to your machine was and and how thorough it was in terms of the different types of phenomena um, that are experienced. 
Um, one of the questions was, uh, can you tell us about um, one specific, one or two of specific uh, investigations you were involved in and how you interpreted uh, the findings that you came, you got from the MESA machine, MESA sit sure. setup? Right. Uh, just about usually, just about every place we go, it's, it's those geomagnetic changes, all right? Now, that's a tri-field meter. But when you have a geomagnetic change like this, that's when people really experience things, all right? And some people are going to hear or some people are going to sense things. Uh, maybe they, or they're going to see things. I've had all of that happen. I've seen what I consider, I thought was a real person, but it was a ghost. Uh, and it was in Kentucky, a uh, little way out in the middle of nowhere, a place called Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Uh, there's three farms, and we went to the very first farm and set up a, an embarrassing array of stuff. Video cameras, audio recorders, and I saw a Civil War ghost. He looked just like a real person. And he was walking up the driveway, and then he walked across the front yard. And at that time, they didn't mow their front yard, so the grass was a little high, eh, maybe about a foot high. And he's got gray pants, white shirt, red suspenders, gray coat, and a gray hat. Uh, beautiful, uh, kind of a lighter brown uh, boots. And I thought it was a real person. So I said exactly what they say on TV through all the ghost shows and stuff. They say, what the hell? And that's what I did. So I ran outside. I bet you I ran around the house about four times looking for somebody that had a white T-shirt and red suspenders but there's nobody there because <laughs> he was a ghost. Uh, I've also had an experience at the Willard Library where it felt like somebody ran up to me, grabbed my left arm, and then ran away. And it was kind of warm and wet, like they had, like they had wet hands or wet arms. And it kind of it kind of felt like a like a little boy or a little girl. So uh, I've had my own experiences. So I know that people have them all the time. And I'm just trying to figure out if it's caused by these different, you know, magnetic fields or not. Do you, do you have an a, a opinion uh, about certain areas that you go to investigate and what, uh, or certain, um, you know, combinations of geomagnetic or the gravity or uh, different changes in the atmosphere that might open up the ability to see what's being, what's happening. I mean, I, I see where you can explain away with some of these in, uh, uh, pieces of physical information sure. evidence, but you can also have another sort of a theory that says, now we've got a situation where people are going to be able to see what's happening. So which yeah. way? Yeah. I think it's kind of both <laughs> because I think I could, you could go to a place, not have any real changes, but people still have experiences. And that might be more of a spiritual thing going on that cannot be measured. So you could have, or you could have the opposite. You could have places that have huge uh, magnetic changes and and have no experiences at all so it kind of goes both ways but there's also yeah, that third yeah there's also that third thing that it could be spiritual and you can't measure it at all there's no you know and people have those experiences too you know that are more spiritual they're you can't measure them there's no physical thing that you could say, ooh, there it is. It's just mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. Yeah. 
Have, are you familiar with, uh, uh, I can't, it's not really a machine, but Tony Cornell and Alan Gold used to have this kind of table put together, the spider system. I've, I've forgotten what spider stood for. Yeah. I thought that this is what your your system kind of sounds like, that you have much more sophisticated uh, detectors, but it's a conglomeration of a variety of things that you're measuring at the same time, like spider was. Right. That's, yeah, that's what, that's what we tried to do. Uh, the one thing about geomagnetic fields, when you measure those, you can't just have a sensor and set it down or, you know, walk around with it. You have to, what you really need to do is set it down and have it connected to an amplifier. Okay. That's the way you can see what's really going on. And that, and what the research says uh, through Persinger and others is that there's changes. William Roll uh, did some studies, Dean Radin, and those changes are like five to seven milligauss. And that's what kind of makes people sense, experience things. Um, but I think it might be different, especially if you're a little more sensitive to those things. And I think some people are. Some people get information in a lot of different ways and uh, are able to say what th that person is or a little bit more about what they got from the environment and they can say what it is. Yeah, exactly. Think. It. it yeah, you're you're so right. It's it's very very complicated, and there's so many variables that are place related, person related, and yep. then a bunch phenomena of related. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's... Yeah. I thought uh, the guy that you saw reminded me of of Nathaniel Hawthorne's story because I think there was one. Uh, it might have been the Mister Harris that you mentioned, the guy that would be uh, sitting at the table in the library reading the newspaper and then kind of vanish after he passed away. Yeah. And that yeah. was a daytime uh, sighting with with that that aspect of being looking like it was a living human being sitting there, and then they vanish. It vanish. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, someone had asked if if Mesa is like in a package that you sell, or or if it if it's if it's just if it's just a conglomeration of things that you're putting together to make yeah. to make this this multi sensor I, array. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to patent everything, but it's all available. Mm. So. I'm still thinking about maybe patenting the process. I don't know how much it would cost, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can buy you can buy all of the things on the internet now uh, pretty easily, uh, and it it really wouldn't cost that much money, I think. But you have to make an analog to digital converter. That's the thing, and that's the uh -huh. box that is you know your digital to analog or analog to digital stuff so you can connect uh -huh. it to your laptop that's probably the the thing that you really that might cost the most money uh, uh -huh. the sensors are not, the sensors are not that much money but yeah they're out there right oh yeah it's you fascinating can, you can though Oh, Tom, yeah. Tom Ruffles just translated spider for me. He says it's the spontaneous psychophysical incident data recorder. And, yeah. and I'm having Brian uh, get the URL for investigating the paranormal, which is where I first saw the chapter on, on the use of the spider. And it was okay. actually, it was uh, uh, what struck me about it was that it was just ingenious and it and it was you know it had that it had the photo the uh, camera that went on and off depending on what was happening it had an audio that was doing that as well i think they even had some That's other stuff want, going uh, on yep yeah i want to i want to put video and audio back into the system uh which i hope we can do soon uh, I had I have to find somebody that that knows Linux. Uh huh. How, ah. 
So I'm going to take a, a channel out and try to put video back in somehow. It might only be able to do like a sample every five seconds or something like that. But I, I'd like to add video and audio back into the system. Uh, I've just been using, you know, video recorder, a digital video recorder, but it's separate from, you know, the data. So I want to put it back in somehow. Eventually. Yeah, I think I think that would be wonderful. I, I the the uh, Tom Ruffles just gave us a, a link. Um, uh, 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 to a blog post that he did on Tony Cornell and the Spider, um, what I, some of the photographs that we had for that book, because I I did the uh, page production for that book when I was working at the PF in New York, and right. um, uh, the photographs were amazing, and they were things that were taken in the middle of the night, and things were falling off, that kind of thing, and Tony wasn't <laughs> there, nobody was there, everything was nobody locked was up. Yeah, exactly. So it was it was quite interesting, I must say. But this is a very interesting uh, way. And I've always been interested in, in, in this method of yours because I thought it was a really good idea to kind of gather data uh, uh, in, a, in a very complex environment and then try and have that data to to match up with the uh, with the. The, what you and your team are experiencing and what other people have experienced in that same area. How how often have you had the chance over the years to use the MESA? Well, I've used it probably about 250 times. Wow. Uh, probably since 1994. And we improved it somewhat with better uh, graphs uh, that are more three-dimensional. Uh, we also added the weather station, which we could have put on a long time ago. We just didn't end up have enough channels. But now we have a, a second system um, that we're going to try to use, and it has 11 channels. So we can have a few more things, but I, I'm going to try to get video and audio back in there if I can. But we have a weather station, um, and some other things like the random number generator uh -huh. to incorporate yeah it. yeah that's very interesting now, uh, now i hate to ask this question but um have you written up any case studies uh of where you speculate on what's going on or is there that's someone else that that's what i'm gonna have to do next uh -huh. i want brian wonderful i want brian to help me I was gonna just going to gonna volunteer Brian, and I thought I better yeah. not. But, but Brian and I have talked right. about it. We just Wonderful. haven't done anything yet. So, uh -huh. yeah, I need I need to do a preliminary findings thing and, and try to add to it. That I'm would be super than that, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Do say that. that again, Brian. What did you say? I said I'm certainly open to that for what he wants. Oh, yeah. good. So. Tim has, been very gracious in, uh, Tim has been very gracious in making some of the MESA data available to me, and I've done a few analyses for him about it, which have been rather interesting. So that'll be something that can be the foundation for a paper that can be written up about it that he and I can that put would together. Be, that'd be terrific. Yeah. Because it's it's really very interesting, and it's it's these multivariable approaches I think are super useful. I mean, it's it it. it uh, it reminds me of G of Jerry Sulfin's uh, talk as well about some of the things that you guys are interested in databasing, Brian and, and Jerry. Um, all of this is going to help. And I think back in the day when uh, Dean was interested in uh, e EMF and geomagnet mag and all that stuff, a lot of those preliminary reports were just fascinating. And when you match them up with uh, the, the uh, experiencers, um, um uh, and I got myself I always get myself into this place where I have to say experiencers experience so yeah. <laughs> sorry about sorry yeah. about that but it's but it's very it. interesting when the two things are put together the narrative and all of the actual physical um evidence that's being taken yep that's definitely important I need to make sure that I write down what what people experience <laughs> Mm 
Yeah, and also having a asking them when you do your investigations if they would be willing later on to be interviewed. That's always a good idea. I, Carlos and I did that with surveys and never got the funding to actually interview people, but it's one of those things that uh, uh, even if you get an initial yes and contact information, that may be somebody that you can go back to later on and get more details yeah. from. So that's yep. always a good idea. Does anybody else have any more questions or comments? Um, Tom and, and Brian have been loading up the chat with all kinds of things that are going to go into the de the uh, description under the video. Cool. And Eduardo had to leave. He was he was the guy that asked about uh, Persinger's work. Oh yeah, Michael yeah. Persinger. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's a very, it's a very, very interesting uh, way of handling, um, uh, handling these kinds of cases. Are you with a particular group that if someone in the area um, uh, it, it can get in touch with you guys about things that are going on? And a lot of the people that are here are bloggers and people in different areas and also ghost hunters and the same in terms of our YouTube group. Um, uh, uh so where would where would we send them if they wanted to get in touch with you about mesa or about uh, the way that you do your your data a really good question i have an email that i've used since 1994 and it's t amazon michael h-a-r-t-e at juno j-u-n-o dot com i'm also in charge of a prairie land paranormal consortium group which is on facebook and we're actually meeting march 25th here in springfield illinois at the lincoln library it's 326 south 7th street in springfield and so i'll i i, I get people to uh, tell me about places where they've investigated that I can go to. Um, sometimes I get a new place or uh, somebody might contact me usually through that group or other people that are involved with that group. Um, uh, can you give me the time of the meeting and also the, the address oh, yes. of the library again? Yeah. The, li the library is 326 South 7th Street, Springfield, Illinois. Okay. Uh, the meeting time is going to be every last Saturday of the month. Uh, so we're going to meet March 25th, and it's always 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And we talk about a lot of other things besides haunts and, and, and you know, haunt phenomena. We talk about UFOs and um, Bigfoot and all kinds of other things that occur. Uh -huh. And that people so tell it's a, us it's a wide net um, for paranormal. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, it's a paranormal consortium. So, yeah. Well, I've, I've got that in the chat now, so we'll be putting that in the description. And I can't help myself, but I was born and raised in Illinois. So have you ever uh, had the opportunity to do any kind of work at the at Lincoln's house in Springfield? No, I can't get into Lincoln's house. Ooh. I wish I could. <laughs> it's, it's federal, so I don't, yeah. I don't even know. I guess I could just go talk to somebody and see, but I kind of doubt if they would let me in. Um, I'm also, tr I'd really like to get into the, uh, Dana Thomas house. Ah, I um, don't know about this. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, designed it and, and it's, uh, it's on fourth and Lawrence, I think in Springfield. I'd like to get into that place and do an investigation. She used to have seances. She was, uh, she was a spiritualist and, ah. um, uh, rich very big house that was uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, there are places in Springfield, of course, that are haunted um, that I've investigated. Uh, one is the, um, 
Oh, it used to be called Norbandy's. It's a bar. Um, it's changed hands many times and now it's closed. So there's nobody I can even contact to do that place. But uh, I'm sure I'll find some other places like this year that I'll go into. I just haven't. Wonderful. Well, hey, yeah. No plans right now. So. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder because when we were, when Carlos and I were at the on site at the foundation, Parapsychology Foundation in New York City, we um, did two presentations at the Merchant House Museum, which was a location that Dan Sturgis and New York Paranormal had investigated. The first uh, time that we were there um, was prior to 9 11, and uh, we had 1,500 people. We, we were all terrified about what was going to happen to the house with all those people in the, in the front room and the dining room and on the stairs going up to the second floor. And it was a very interesting um, uh, uh, experience, uh, especially for Carlos, because he was giving the talk, and they have a, uh, they have a, um, a mannequin of the woman who's supposed to have be the, the the apparition and the mannequin was right behind him so every time he kind of turned his head to take a question it was like oh you know yeah. <laughs> seeing, seeing that That's that funny. behind him uh the yeah. second one we yeah exactly the second one we did in october or november after 9 11 and we were all still so frightened in new york city to to be together that i think we had 15 people mostly the staff of the pf and the staff of merchant house and and dan sturgis and and some of the Nor new york paranormal folks um so that was also a very good lecture but it wasn't it wasn't as well attended and and i don't remember how actually dan and his group got the permission to do that. I think that um, I've forgotten her name now, but I think that the woman that was running it was interested actually in having something uh, done because that was sort of the beginning of all of those shows back in the 2000s and late 90s and so on, um, just to get to help them keep the maintenance up on that on that house, which is very important in New York City because it was originally built quite early in the history of the merchant class in New York City. And it was okay. just that, yeah, it was just that the woman that had died and left it to the foundation lived 90 some years and uh, wow. her father or her grandfather had built the house. I don't remember the details now, but well, good luck with that, because um, I, for those of you who don't know why Springfield is is connected to Abraham Lincoln, it's because that was one of the houses that he lived in and um uh and we uh we kind of own him in illinois <laughs> he's our guy yeah he, his house that's in springfield is the only house he ever owned um, yeah the one on seventh street there and yeah uh, i think i've been in it five or six times over my life yeah. just just fast also have a, a presidential library and museum now that's ah. um, associated with it so yeah, I haven't been there since the 80s. I was always uh, going down with college friends and all that stuff from Northern Illinois really? down to Springfield to see the house. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tim. This is very interesting. And um, people, well, thank you very much. And people found it very thorough. And um, uh, it's kind of a wonderful uh, move into to what else and uh, journaling is going to do on Saturday. Um, because it's the the uh, kind of the background of of how far back these these experiences go. I mean, just right. really every culture you can imagine, every religion you can imagine, every a, a region of the planet uh, you can imagine have had these types of of, of of phenomena without a whole lot of difference you know that the you see the features of american cases and features of every other kind of cases that there are out there so it's it's great to have been able to um hear that uh walk through the history of the of the area well it's almost 90 minutes and we we try not to wear our speakers out completely <laughs> so <laughs> i want to say thank you
Yeah, I want to say thank you to uh, uh, thank you to you again, and let me pop up my PowerPoint. So I just wanted to let you know what's going on to uh, not tomorrow, rather, but Friday, we will have Lloyd Auerbach talking about apparitions. And does that show? Do they show consciousness beyond death? It will take place on Friday, the 17th of March, as I said, at 4 p.m. Central. In this presentation, veteran parapsychological field investigator and educator Lloyd Auerbach will discuss apparitional experiences and phenomena as evidence for consciousness serving bodily, uh, surviving bodily death. He'll first examine different differences between the various ghostly phenomena of apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists, and segue into different categories of apparitions. He'll present some common sense questions in relation to the evidence that can lead quickly to the dismissal of much folklore about ghosts. From there, he'll brief, briefly discuss theories and models of apparitions, why they may stay, stick around, and what makes a great evidential apparition case. He'll finish up with a deep dive into cases that provide strong evidence for apparitions as an interactive consciousness without a physical body. So I hope you won't miss that one. Um, we're looking forward to that. And uh, uh, so thank you again, Tim. And we'll see the rest of you on Friday. Bye now.